Hey, Dr. Jones, how are you? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, yeah, audio is great. What about you? Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. It's a. Uh, it's nice to uh, nice to meet you formally, virtually. Right. Yes. So good to see a face. I know, right? Um, Times of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Doctor DeBlack speaks super highly of you. That's uh, I think. I, I didn't connect the dots. You know, I was like, I'd seen this lecture that you had put up that I actually show it to my classes and have. Oh, like, really? Yeah, it's a uh, hold. It's the slate uh, in the in the wilds of the South where you're talking yeah. about space and uncultivated. Yeah, I actually space. didn't even know that was on the internet. So that's cool. <laughs> it is. It is. It's got a few hundred views. Congratulations. Oh. Yeah, but it's a, it's a really good presentation and. Um, I connect like, and then I saw you at like Thurman's thesis defense. Right. And I didn't even, I, I honestly didn't even know. I was like, oh, Thurman had another person come watch his thesis. It's not a professor. I didn't think you were a professor for some reason. You'd come, you'd come in maybe like a few minutes later or something. And then I was like, that's the same person from this lecture. It's this <laughs> person Dr. DeBlack keeps talking about. So, oh. yeah. I, oh, I adore Tom DeBlack also. Uh, he's helped me uh, a lot over the last year since I started teaching Arkansas history. He gave me this book. Oh, yes. So. I actually have mine sitting right here. Too. Ah. <laughs> you know what? Let me close. I've got my email window up and it's dinging. So I don't want okay. to not yeah, want you're that good. to happen. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, let's let's get started here. Yeah, Thank let's you. do. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Um, I've been uh, been looking forward to this. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about your book, but I just had some general general questions for you. Um, and then just like even more broadly about uh, just the topic of slavery in Arkansas. Uh, this right. is definitely something that um, I'm learning more about through teaching the class uh, since I had the class with Dr. DeBlack. So, right. Yeah. So you did get the joy of the DeBlack experience in the Arkansas history class. Good for Big you. Big time. Yeah. I saw him perform the the big bar. That's he would he would perform this little skit each oh, each. Oh right, yes, I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah. it was great. Um, but yeah, he's um. You know, I've got a, a painting. I had Neil Harrington uh, do a commission, and it's Neil's rendition of the Arkansas Traveler. Ooh. And I've got I got one made for me, but I got one made for Doctor DeBlack. But it's been COVID time, and I'm oh. I want to protect that guy, you know. Yes, I know. Yeah, I uh, mailed him a book, and I was just thinking, like, are we sure this is just air? Most of, like mostly <laughs> air. Like, do I need to like? Does he need to like lice all this book when he gets it out of the mailbox or what? For real, yeah. Like that's been weeks ago I, though, so I think know. he's okay. Yeah. Well, hey, so how'd you how'd you so? You know, we'll we'll get to right now in a minute. But how did you first get into history? In history, okay. So I went to for undergrad. I went to UALR, and um, like a lot of um, you know working class, you know first time college students, I had this idea like I've got to go and get like training for like a high paying job. You know, so I was going to be a business major, and I was going to do advertising and public relations because it like fit my personality, you know, because I like people or I used to. And um, so, uh, and I'm creative, you know, and so I was like, yeah, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And so I noticed that like my friends who were history majors just enjoyed their classes so much more than I did. And I, and I enjoyed mine. And it's like, you know, the further I went up, I think I was a business major for like a year and a half too. I mean, I just got barely into, you know, those upper level classes, you know, accounting to business calculus and stuff like that. And I was like, man, this is just cold. And it's, it doesn't feel like it's about people. I mean, it is, I mean, business is about people, but the classes weren't, you know what I mean? And I was just like, Ugh, and I was really coveting like experience that my friends were having. And, um, and so I switched to history and um, the family kind of freaked out because, you know, like, what are you going to do with that? Like the big question, what are you going to do with that? Right. Um, how that. are you going to make money? That. Right. And it's like, well, the obvious answer that most people have is, okay, so you're going to teach. And so, you know, I picked up the secondary ed licensure, you know, as I did it, which, you know, UALR has a really great program for that. And so I got to take really great classes with 
um, really important Arkansas historians, Carl Moneyhon, oh, yeah. um, C. Fred Williams, rest his soul. He's not with us anymore, but he is a very important um, Arkansas historian. Um, I actually am embarrassed to say I didn't get any classes with um, Charlie Bolton. Oh. Just, I don't know. I got kind of ended up uh, taking a lot of these other like non-US classes. So I didn't actually get any of Charles Bolton's classes, but um, I just, I um, really, it fed me, you know, in a way that like the business major didn't. And so it was like, this is obviously, you know, what I wanted to do. And I, you know, I thinking back, like when I was a business major, like I read the novel Andersonville, the civil war novel. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's so good. And then I went and looked in the back and I found the, um, that they are, they were published and available, like some of the diaries that that author used to base that narrative on. So I went and got them from the library. Was like, and I was still a business major. It's like, how do you not know you're a history major when you're just like on the side, like going and doing like primary source readings? Like, come on. So it yeah. was destined. That is such an interesting point, though, because um, I got that same sort of response. Like, what what are you going to do with this? And you know, I like my wife and I own. A, a rather successful martial arts gym, like one of the one of the more successful ones in the state, you know, without a doubt. And I thought too, the whole time I was taking history, I was like, "Well, I'm probably going to get, you know, like an MBA or something, you know, since my business." And you know, I had I, I have a very successful business, but I didn't get a degree in right in any kind of marketing management business, any kind of um, program like that. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it then too, I, at one point I was like, I think, you know, a radiology technician, you know, that, mm -hmm. that was a career path for me. So it didn't turn out that way. I'm glad though, because I yeah. love everything that I'm involved with. Right. Yeah. I will say, you know, it's a good plug here for the, you know, humanities degree overall, because um, people are, you know, trained to think in terms of like, useful applicable education versus academic education and i think one of the things that we're learning especially in these crazy times we're in is that um humanities like asking essential questions about society and people and connections like that stuff is is valuable um and it's actually not contradictory you know being um you know a successful business owner who also contributes to the community's understanding of history via your teaching and your sort of informal work on that. I mean, that all, that all meshes in a way that, you know, back in the nineties, when everybody was pushing, you know, bachelors in business, like people weren't thinking in those terms. So yeah. we're, in a, we're in a pretty cool moment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's, it's panning out. So uh, wh where did you end up getting, so you're at UALR, did you, where'd you get your master's? Uh, I you... went to the university of North Texas Oh. and they've got a good, um, um, they, their rankings have climbed since then, but they actually also offer a PhD, believe it or not. This is a pretty big school in um, Texas. It's about, it's in Denton, Texas, and it's about, mm, when I was there, I think they had hit 30,000 students, so it's much more than that now. And so it sounds like, you know, like the regional title, it sounds like sort of small and random, but um, they're, it's a pretty big department, and their um, history department is respected, especially in uh, military history. Uh, I didn't go there for military history. I went there because I thought I was going to study like missions, like in the Southwest. So I thought like tech, I don't know. I'm actually not really sure like what the reasoning was exactly. Uh, so I actually, I went there thinking I was going to study the Southwest and um, I was taking all of these classes that had like a Mexican American focus or like a Texas focus, uh, yeah. they, you know, they had a strong program in that. And, um, and I just got like text out, you know, and I was in this seminar on the topic of the old South and the old South seminar was taught by a old professor who I still love and he knows he's old, right? I mean, he's got to be up in his eighties by now. Okay. And he's still teaching. I believe he is. Um, and so I look at the reading list and we have this list and we're like splitting it up, you know, through the seminar semester. And then we were supposed to read, I think we're supposed to choose like two or three other books um, on another list to read and turn papers in like independently of the class meeting. So we had like our in-class work and then we had all this other stuff that we didn't present on. And so I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm feeling text out. I was like, I'm going to look for something about slavery in Arkansas. I'm going to read my paper about, I'm going to do my paper about that. 
right? Show these Texans that there's more to it, right? <laughs> um, I look at the list and I'm like, oh, this is outdated. There's a book, there's one book about slavery in Arkansas and it was from 1958. And I was like, well, the professor is really old. He probably just needs the list updated. And so when I talked to him about it, he was like, no, ma'am, that is the most recent book, Link the Study, focusing on slavery in Arkansas. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be my job. Then that was about 2007. Okay. And I decided yeah. that was going to be my mission, was to fill the hole. And I haven't had any competition. Yeah, that's great. What a cool, weird? what a cool niche. Because well, I mean, that's like a section in the textbook, right? Right. Um, and it's definitely a pretty like I I remember Doctor DeBlatt getting heavy into that in his course in a in a whole lecture, and then we had like another lecture on just Lakeport, like like in the Annabelle Mare, but right. It, but he, I mean, because I still have those notes. And Cora, after me, my wife took that class, and I have her notes too. Oh man, <laughs> yeah. So I, but too, and then I will just hit him up. I'm like, hey, it says here you showed this documentary. Like, what what was that? I can't find it anywhere. You know, so. I've hit him up about this, like trying to follow the same, but that's, a, that's a, I feel like a, a rather, I mean, I have a whole writing assignment. I have a dude that's out of the ordinary, the normal flow of the class uh, in my class, you know, but that's great that, that there's not competition there. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's also, but it's also kind of sad though. Right. Because um, For real. what we need and hopefully the book will help, you know, with this. Um, but what we need is a lot of people, not just, you know, talking about this in class, but like reading about it, reading stuff that's um, not just based on the more newly available sources, but like new interpretations of those sources. You know what I mean? Like the questions that we ask about, the questions that scholars ask and the things that they emphasize concerning slavery in 2020 are really different from even from, you know, 2000, 2005, you know, it's changed a lot. And so the historiography, the more voices we have in there, the richer, you know, the history is, because then when you synthesize, you know, the next textbook on Arkansas history, you've got like a lot of different perspectives, you know, in there, a lot of different documents, a lot of different angles, you know, so, but, you know, I, I think probably what happened was I was very um, open and going around the state early on as a grad student talking about my research from day one. And so I think people were just kind of like, oh, there's a slavery girl, like there's a person doing this. And so it's like covered, you know what I mean? And then in like the larger world of Southern history, Arkansas gets, uh, Arkansas is like the stepchild, you know, of like Southern history, it's super weird. I've even argued with people who um, have claimed, people who are not from anywhere around here, who have claimed that Arkansas is not, part, not really part of the South. I'm like, really? 1957 Little Rock crisis? case closed, right? Like, are you kidding? It's people from like the Carolinas, you know, who they don't think of the Western South as part of like, I don't know, the Southeast part of the South, you know? And uh, the thing that I remind them is in the 10 years before the Civil War, there is no place where slavery grew faster than Arkansas. Oh yeah, Other that's than super some, interesting. Some parts of East Texas, the exception, mm. yeah. yeah. So it's like, come on, you know, we need more airtime. So that's like the sermon I'm always preaching. You know, the Trans-Mississippi South just doesn't get the love that it needs. Man, the Trans-Mississippi, uh, I was talking, uh, do you know Marie Totten? I do. So she's been on the podcast a couple of times. Um, I was, I just did a podcast with her husband and we were we were talking about some of these same same topics. On oh, yeah. Her, right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, but it, so like, yeah, I asked Dr. DeBlack, I was like, hey, what's a good, you know, what's a good resource that I could look into? Like I, around the same time I emailed you asking for like territorial period uh, suggestions and stuff, I was like right in the same part of the class I'm in right now, like mm -hmm. right pre-Civil War. Uh, he was like, well, you need to wait because Dr. Jones, she's got this book coming out and that's what you need. And ah, I was, right. I was like, all right, well, we, you know, I can't wait. Is it, is there going to be an audio book available or just, just print? You no, know, um, I haven't heard anything about audio book plans. There's not anything in the contract about audio book, but, um, I, they, I have made friends with a history person out on the West coast who has, I don't know if he, 
I don't know what, but he's always on Twitter. Like if you guys want your book and audio book, talk to me and then I'll, I, he's like a liaison between a lot of academics and I guess like audible or something, you know, and like working with the press and the author and, and like getting audio books out. He does a podcast on, you may have, you may be familiar with it. He does a podcast on um, Jacksonian era America. Interesting. And um, I think it's called the Jackson pocket. I mean, something like obvious, you know, like that. He hasn't been doing it much lately because I think he just finished up his PhD comps or is fixing to take them, you know, or something like that. But he's always like, you guys can do an audio book, you know? So I don't know. It's, I think it must not be as hard as I think it is. I would certainly not read it because I can't stand like my own recorded voice. I can never do my own audio book. <laughs> so, you can get like John C. Riley or somebody to right, read. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Get somebody else to do it. He, that they do. Man, there's some great um, readers. Uh, sometimes I like it when the author reads. I've done yeah. over 70 audio books this year. So I really, yeah. really enjoy audio books, yeah. but I have a huge library of physical books as well. So, right. I like it all. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I like all forms. Uh, and two, I have like all my notes from all the classes I ever took. I pull those off the shelf all the time. Yeah. Know? Oh man. Are you kidding? The binders that you can't see, they're like hidden because they're ugly and old are, um, if, I mean, I'm talking money Han, notes from money Han's class. Like I said, Fred Williams, you know, all of them, it's all in there. That's yeah. so cool. You had money. I mean, he comes up all the time. Oh man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Fun. Yeah. So at what point did you, so you decide it like right then when you're, you're, you figure out that's a niche you can fill. At what point did you decide to transfer over to the U of A? Right. So that was actually part of the, the decision was, so I get down there and I'm like talking to my friends, the professors, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You really need to do this. Oh my gosh. You know? And, um, so I'm like, well, I got to go where the documents are, where the enthusiasm is. Right. You know? Um, and so, that's what I did. And when I met, um, when I came to talk to them about doing the PhD program at the um, University of Arkansas, Jeannie Wayne was the chair at that time. I came and talked to her and met her. And um, she, and like so many other people, like she would say, oh, well, I would say, well, I want to do my dissertation on slavery in Arkansas. And then people would often ask, and she was one of these, okay, well, like what part, you know, like, well, what like what county or couple of counties or like, or you, do you want to talk about um, women in slavery or do you want to talk about, um, I don't know, like up country or low, I don't know, something like that. And I'm like, no, like all of it. Like, I just want to, we need a, we can't start, we can't keep just chipping away. Cause right. There's all these, there's a handful of good, you know, master's theses on various topics, you know, about slavery in Arkansas, you know, little articles here and there. Um, the stuff that's like more like macro though is like small. So for example, Charles Bolton's stuff about slavery and the defining of Arkansas that came out in the nineties, the Arkansas historical quarterly did a special issue in like 94 or something. I'm not going to get that exactly right. Um, but, um, you know, but just sort of keep just continuing to chip away at the issue is not, you know, doing it for me. So I was like, I'll just be the new Orville Taylor. That's the author of the older, um, 1958 book. And I'll just do the best I can. I'll just bite off the biggest chunk I can, you know? And that sort of weirded Jeannie Wayne out, but she took it on, you know, with me and um, never blinked. <laughs> you know, there, so just a topic, uh, and maybe we could start getting into, like, there's one that you bring up Jeannie Wayne, which is one of the authors of the, the textbook for the course. Right. I was watching that documentary, uh, The Forgotten Expedition. Uh, is that the Dunbar? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it's on PBS Arkansas, and it's one of those that the Black showed, but I could never find it. And it was, uh, I, they just put it back up when they made like the conversion of PBS oh. Arkansas, right? Okay. But it's a great documentary. It's like 54 minutes or something like that. Uh, but I it, should, it covers. I should look into it. Yeah, it's, it's great. I, I just shared it with my class, and I was like, hey, guys, that documentary I was talking about, I found it. Because I was like lamenting to him. I was like, Went back when I had this class, we mm. got to watch this documentary. It was <laughs> real good. But because uh, there's like a short little clip uh, by the Secretary of State on YouTube. But yeah, there's a, a ton of great oh. Arkansas yeah. history resources. But anyway, Jeannie Wayne, um, she was talking about the the expedition on the Washita about them running into this um, runaway slave named mm -hmm. Harry. And 
they detained him. They're like, hey, what are you doing? You know, and this would have, this is 1804, 1805. Right. But I found, I just thought that was such an interesting story. I was like, well, and one of them was a plantation owner. So that makes a little bit of sense. But I was mm -hmm. like, it just really got me thinking and wondering what, uh, what, impressions were like uh at that time like what slavery was like on the frontier oh, right. in that time and the fact that they were immediately were like hey we know that you're a runaway pretty much like you have no account of yourself is what they said mm -hmm. but but then Jeannie wayne was talking she's like and this says this in the book too i like connected the dots on that is that people would run away and then like you talk about it in your talk too but go to the woods right right so I, I guess I kind of take that in context. It's like, that's what that guy was doing, spending time in the woods. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about being in a place where, you know, most Americans, black and white, think it's just like the edge of the civilized world, you know, is that there's plenty of woods to hide in, plenty of swamps to hide in. You know, one of the things that uh, we understand if we kind of put ourselves in that time period is that on horseback is is the the main sort of um, mode of travel that we think of for like anybody who's who would be patrolling for runaways and imagine like the limitations of that like how slow that must be you know in these places so there's just the benefit of that and certainly the time period that um you're mentioning with this expedition it's just everybody's putting around on these little flat boats you know what i mean like you're not gonna be able to pursue anybody very quickly uh but you can get away on foot from somebody uh pretty easily so yeah, but it's it's a, at that time it's a very thin population. So that person probably ran up north of ish, right, um, from a place like you know in Louisiana or something. I mean, just a wild, just like a wild guess. Uh, but it's very um, sparsely populated, and like and it stays that way, like seen as this like sort of wild place that where you know lawless people who are up to no good um, hide in, you know. Um, all the way up through, I mean, I'd say even close to 1840. I mean, people think of it as um, um, what Rothman called the morass. You know, it's like this wild place where it just you know, sort of anything goes and it's lawless. And if you're up to no good, it's a good place for you to head to. And they think of obviously runaway, runaways from slavery as up to no good, right? And so it's a haven in some way. It's kind of like the dismal swamp, right? Like out in the East, you know, a place where um, you can have, uh, we're not going to go as far as to say like maroon societies, you know, of runaways. Um, but certainly people crisscrossing and coming and going and hiding all the time. Yeah. You, and you did mention like, um, there being like a base of maroon slaves, like around, um, Little Rock. Right. right so like they're town. hiding in the swamps outside of the yeah. town because I mean, it's not much of a town anyway. Right. It's like very small, but yeah. So they're able to do this a little bit. Uh, it's nothing like you see in other parts, you know, the Atlantic world, like as far as numbers, you know, but yeah, they're doing the same essential thing, which is like hide, you know, raid for supplies and food, you know, hide again. It's pretty interesting. So, you know, in that talk, uh, you talked a lot about uncultivated space, but you really talked uh, about, uh, I felt like you were getting into the territorial period, like pre-Civil War, mostly. Um, what is... Like, and you're talking about your book is is going to be is uh, is a broad approach. What all do you cover in your book? Like, how do you lay it out? So the book is, um, like you said, it's um, it's broad as far as I'm trying to pull in, you know, the whole state, and um, I'm trying to pull in the different types of work that enslaved people are doing. Most of the discussion is about cotton, corn, and livestock, but of course they're doing other things, you know, as well. Um, and so I cut it up. It's roughly chronological. So the beginning has to do with, you know, that morass and like that um, kind of reputation for lawlessness that is just the bane of the existence of slaveholders, um, but provides some outlet uh, for enslaved people. And, um, and then I moved to kind of looking a, a bit sort of like bird's eye view on the river systems in Arkansas and kind of touching down in certain places to give you a little bit more of a specific idea of what life on the ground, you know, would be like for people there. And then it moves to um, a little more thematic. So I've got a chapter on um, like their material life, housing, food, clothing, the kind of stuff that's, I mean, it's well-mined, you know, as far as the historiography of 
American slavery, slavery overall, but um, the specific experiences of people in Arkansas, right, we just, it's just not so much out there. So, um, okay, I'm looking at that, talking about um, power and space and placemaking and just kind of the way that people tried to make a home, you know, out of a place where they're supposed <clears throat> to be um, a place in a situation where they're intended to be, you know, dispossessed. Um, and so, and then we moved to, I've got a chapter that's um, more like agriculturally focused. It kind of takes you through the crop routine, takes you through the crop year, um, through the, you know, kind of like the weekly routine, you know, how like Saturdays and Sundays might be different from the regular part of the week. And then um, kind of zooms you down into like the day. It takes you through like a day um, for some of these people. Like what's, what's it like in the morning? What's it like in the evening? Like when do they have opportunities to carve out you know, some breathing space for their own, you know, family time and their own concerns. Um, and then certainly there's a um, civil war chapter. And what I try to do with that one, because it is sort of a large mass of stuff to talk about in one book, um, I try to stick to people who are experiencing the war while still held as captive labor. So the, the book does not offer, this is my disclaimer, the book does not offer a comprehensive treatment of the process of, of emancipation in Arkansas uh, because that, man, that's, that it's deserves book. more, right, that deserves uh, more, you know, attention and focus, you know, and so I try to make it clear to people that that, that we're, you're going to get a sense of how that played out, but it's not going to be a comprehensive one, like different parts of the state at different times, you know, it, you're not going to get it you know, there. So, and yeah. then the conclusion is in some ways a little bit of an epilogue because it gives you, kind of take some of those themes from earlier in the book, um, uh, the use of the environment, relationship with the land, the power struggle of, you know, related to space and place, the ability and the sort of attempts to create a sense of home and place and sort of what happens to people after the war. And so I've kind of grabbed a few folks and tell you, a little bit about what how they try to make meaning you know out of their surroundings and farm acreage and and some of them just say peace out to arkansas totally you know yeah. nice how long did it take you uh is this did you start writing this when you were in graduate school how long did it take you to put the whole uh, book together well you know um i guess the very very beginning was the my master's thesis on um it's called Slaves and Slaveholders of Hempstead County. So it's not really like a narrative, but it's kind of a, um, a lot of statistical stuff, stuff in there about profitability, which people thought was old school. And then now that's like, this stuff's kind of back, I guess, which is kind of interesting. Um, so a lot of the work in finding out what the sources are and how to get my hands on them and how to read them took place then, you know, in the master's program. Um, but certainly the book manuscript is kind of like, the new improved version of the dissertation, uh, which I started in. I mean, you kind of chip away at it a little bit as you go, you know, but in earnest, I guess I started my dissertation writing in 2011, I think would be right. So when did, when did you graduate with your PhD? 2014. Okay. Yeah. And I guess you were, I saw in the description of that lecture, you, you were a visiting professor at UCA for a while. Right. I was trying to when that was if I was at UCA or not so yeah so um why my sort of dissertation revisions semester was the semester the first semester that I worked as a visiting professor at UCA and so then I defended in like November that semester and then um graduated and so then that spring you know then it was about job interviews <laughs> so uh, yeah so it happened pretty fast how, how long have you been at Arkansas Tech now Let's see, I got here. This is year number three. Okay, I'm also in my yes. thir third year of teaching at a community college, uh, right. USCCM, so. Yeah, it happens so, it, it's weird how much time has passed so quickly. My first tenure track job was in um, Middle Tennessee at this little school. I mean, it's about the same mm -hmm. size. It's a similar size school called Austin P State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. And um, I, I did three years on the tenure track there. And then Tom DeBlack <clears throat> retired. And it was yeah. just too tempting, you know, to come back home. So here I am. 
Yeah. So where are you, you're originally from around Little Rock, you said? I'm originally from Conway County. Okay. Okay. Cool. So oh, yes. real close. Yeah, yeah. So you've been kind of all over the state though, too. With yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. Wow. True. That's true. Because I've taught as a PhD student, I taught at University of Arkansas. I taught for INWAC, Northwest Arkansas Community College while I was up there. And then I taught at UCA. And so and now I'm back here to tech. So I'm just, you know, checking them off. Of this, I guess. I, yeah, I'm not going anywhere yeah, else though. Yeah. This is the end. Well, that's uh, yeah, that's great. The, the, that's got, that's a great job in my opinion. You man, know. it is, man, it is. I, oh man, I, you know, I got my tech swag on right now. I thank my lucky stars every morning when I get up, I'm like, man, I got exactly what I wanted out of this career. I just can't believe it. You know, most academics don't get to choose you know, where they want to live, they just got to go, you know, I got lucky the first job, you know, Middle Tennessee is a great place to live, still easy day, you know, days drive out to see my old people in Arkansas anyway, like, so that was a pretty good gig as it is, but now here to be, you know, physically in the place where there's the most energy for the work that I do, it's like, what else could you ask for, you know? Yeah, yeah, for real. That's amazing. Did you always kind of want it to turn out this way or were you okay with it? You know, like every PhD student who's trying to get a professor job, I had this like hope, like, wouldn't it be cool if I could do my thing and then, you know, be able to like come back home and be around, you know, the family. My sister had four kids, you know what I mean? And like, you know, your old people aren't getting any younger and that kind of thing. And so I um, had kind of had that as like, wouldn't that be great? But it didn't really sort of hold out like, you know, any hope like that it would actually, you know, happen or even getting a job at all. You know what I mean? Like it's hard to get a job at all. Tenure track job, you know, is, is like the Holy grail, right? A full-time teaching job is just about as good, you know, not the exact same kind of security. And then, you know what I mean? Like any job is like so hard to get. It's even worse now than it was when I was on the market. So you can't afford to be too picky, you know, but yeah, I did. I, um, thought it would be super cool, but never thought it would happen. And then it did. So that's pretty awesome. That's, that's amazing though. And, and it's funny how it turns out because I never, you know, I, I wanted it to turn out for me the exact way it, it did. And like, when I talk to other people who are like, like Marie or Eric, I got to talk to some of these same topics about mm -hmm. both of them. And it's like, Marie and I went to graduate school together and she's been out for like six and a half years. And I'm like, you're smarter than me. You teach cooler mm -hmm. classes than I do, but for some reason, I, I'm the one with the with a job. But I don't. I will say, like, I don't get to teach any upper level classes. Like, I'm just so pumped. Right. I get to teach this Arkansas class because that's a nice. It's a nice way to mix it up out of the normal U.S. Oh, one, yeah. two, Civ one and two. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Now, tell me, is Marie? She's she's defending soon her dissertation or she did or <clears throat> I believe it's soon I believe it's soon, soon. Okay. It's coming up um and then her husband Eric just got his PhD so. oh nice okay yeah yeah so yeah, good for them. yeah I know that's amazing and like uh every everybody I talked to that that has got gone through a program it, it is like uh, amazing how long it takes how long were you in oh, the know. PhD program Let's see. I started in 2008 and finished in 2014. And so I didn't break any records. Yeah, you know, that's, that's about seven years or something is, is that yeah, think that's what that's Eric said. That's what usual. Marie's on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, so what kind of, okay. So here's another uh, question I like, because I mean, any it, to build a business, to get an education, especially at the level like you've been, you were in school for a long time, like, <laughs> like what, like what, seven, eight years for your. Well, I spent my, I spent all my twenties in college. I mean, that's what I did with my twenties. So. Oh yeah, I was twenty eight when I got out, but I didn't go back until I was twenty three. Mm -hmm. I dropped out for for a while, but like, what kind of personal sacrifice was did that take for you? You know, um, it started out like the very kind of like usual stuff where it's like, you know, the spouse gets season tickets for football from work. My spouse worked at a bank in Fayetteville. And so they would, they kind of got like a bit of a deal, you know, the bank would buy up 
season tickets and then, you know, whatever. So anyway, we had like this nice little end. Um, and I, you know, every Saturday it's like, I can't go and spend hours in a stadium. Like I need to be sitting with this laptop, you know? So there was like, you know, that's just like sort of one example of like, you know, take, you know, he, he's taking friends to these events instead of me. I don't get to go, you know, to stay home and, you know, like Thanksgiving, eat, grab the laptop, go sit in the corner, you know what I mean? And so you just find ways to like work it into um, the other stuff. So, I mean, I don't know, like boohoo, I guess, first world problems. But I think for me, like the big thing as far as like, you know, what is this going to take and what am I willing to give up for it was when my um, sister, who was a year older than me, was killed in a head-on collision in 2013. And so I spent months I mean I didn't quit but I spent months where I was just kind of like numb and just kind of going through the motions and you know that the, when that kind of stuff is like is it worth like do I have the bandwidth you know what I mean for life's normal and maybe not that normal like sort of course of things and this thing that you know at the it's in some moments of your life just doesn't seem you know very important mm -hmm. um but you know I don't know. I, I don't really know what my point is on that. I guess when it comes to personal sacrifice, it's like it just what it does to your like mental health, you know, to spend all your time feeling like you're behind or for feeling that, that long. you know, like that <clears throat> nagging dread feeling like as a student, you know, to have that for like years, like without end, like it really wears on you. And then if something unexpected happens, then it's like, whoa, man, you know? Yeah. So. I, you know, and maybe, maybe that I can't, uh, you, maybe you can speak to this, like, but maybe that's part of the forging process because I bet, and I, I just like, when I do talk to um, other historians that have gone through PhD programs versus myself, I always get that sense and vibe from them. That's like, oh yes, you're, you, you're more efficient, you know, you, you have more methods and I, I don't know. It's just like, they're working on a different bandwidth to use oh, what you right, said a yeah. second ago with like, yeah, you've been through this. Like when I started teaching, I just thought it was so funny. Cause I had gone through secondary licensure. Uh, I didn't go through the student teaching. I went ahead mm -hmm. and just shifted over, got my master's, but I was like, uh, I, the contrast of, I started teaching at this community college. They're like, yeah, you got it. You got it. Just go teach them. And I was like, yeah, okay i'll do my best you know like i wasn't really i wasn't ready for that you know i mm -hmm. but like when i like um you know like thinking about all the lectures i've put together over the last three years and then i'm talking to like some of these other people for, on the podcast and they prepared like a lecture for the podcast and i'm like that would have taken me days <laughs> Uh, you know, like, and to to think about i mean I, I wrote my thesis, but to think about a book or uh, a dissertation is, you know, that's, that's a other level than my 130 page thesis on martial arts history. That's a whole other level, you know? That's very cool though. Yeah. I mean, you know, the scale is different, you know, it, you know, one, you know, maybe take long from the other, you know, maybe one you're expecting, you know, they're going to expect that you went to, you know, far flung archives, you know, or something, but the essential skills are the same, right? Like, um, you know, using the sources to, you know, ask a good question and answer it, you know, build an argument based on, you know, the pieces that you can grab. So, yeah, but yeah, no, I see what you mean. Like there's like, um, there's like a stamina that you gotta have, which like I'm out of now. <laughs> like I don't, it's, there's none left, like I'm done. <laughs> this book, oh man, I'm, I'm taking a break after this. Yeah, yeah. How, uh, how, how many chapters, how long did it turn out? How many chapters? You know what? I pulled it up because I'm my my eyes crossed now and I see it. Okay, so I've got six chapters. Okay, great, great, nice. Yeah. When is it? Yeah. Uh, do you ever and release? So it looks it? like about manuscript pages. You know, when they make you double space everything. It's four hundred and forty pages. So if that gives wow. you a sense. Wow. But of course, it won't be. You know, it won't be. It won't be like 40, 100, 440 like these kind of pages. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nice, nice. Do you have a release date? So I don't have a date yet. So the um, the best I can figure based on the timeline they've given me so far, we're working on an accelerated timeline with the University of Georgia Press Early American Places series. There's a grant that they that supports them that they want to make sure they get um, as much tied up as they can before they 
may or may not get it renewed, you know, because COVID times, like everything's sort of up in the air. So they're trying to be really fast and efficient with what they've got left is the impression I get, as they should. You know, university presses have to be really um, creative. <laughs> and so the schedule that I have is so I just got my copy edits back. So I have till October 26th to, to give those back to them. And that's my final chance to make any changes at all. So I'm kind of like biting my nails, you know, the, the next couple of weeks. Um, and then it'll go through indexing in January. And then I think after that, it'll be a, it, it takes about three months at least, you know, for the printers and stuff. So mm. I've been telling people probably late spring 2021. Okay. Nice. That's my best guess. All right. Well, um, maybe, um, you know, when it comes back out, um, we can, we could talk about it again or something, right? That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I've got, um, pictures, you know, now at the historic Arkansas museum, let me use in the Butler center of Arkansas studies. So there's going to be some images that the press is letting me, you know, include because anything that you do like that, it's like a little pricey, you know, for them. And so, you know, I'm trying to come up with ways to create visual interest, you know, for people. That's, you know, uh, th one of the reasons I started harassing Dr. DeBack is I was like, hey, you got some good PowerPoints, man. You got pictures I can't find anywhere. Oh, in, right. In, true. in his PowerPoints. He, yeah. he had, he's like, yeah, I got this one from this guy in this year, in 2003. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, I mean, he has pictures of, of I can't find anywhere in any of the older articles, anything online, in any of the books. I'm like, where did you get this stuff? It's yeah, great. where did he get that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll um, I've got a pretty decent um, to black connection right now. Like I he I let him see the manuscript, and actually before it went to copy editing, and he helped me find some like embarrassing errors that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> and um, then I sent him uh, some documents that I got at UNC Chapel Hill 100 years ago when I was doing my dissertation research, and it's this um, plantation down in Chico County. And um, he finally he he sent um, Jeff Woods with a flash drive, and then I took it home. And I put them on there and then I brought the flash drive back to work. And so I hopefully it'll be distant enough and nobody will get each other's germs and uh, he can have these documents. And so anyway, so I think I, I can probably ask him for some cool pictures for PowerPoints. And if I get them, I'll pass them along. To you. Yeah, he well, he did. He's he's hooked me up with his PowerPoints. Oh, he has. Oh, good, some, good, good. Uh, some of them on the flash drive I had got corrupted. So I'm going to have to harass him some more. But I yeah. did. I took back some Game of Thrones DVDs for him to mm. the library. So he owes me. Right. We got to keep black happy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Anytime I text him, he immediately calls me. It's hilarious. It's song black. Yeah. Um, I so, love it. I, I cherish it. I love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. He is great. Um, so I did have a couple of just like questions for you, if you don't mm -hmm. mind, um, yeah. which I, like, I don't know. Uh, people ask, my students ask me questions all the time. And I'm like, well, I never thought of that. I'm sure you have thought of anything that I could possibly ask. Well, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, to not put you on the spot, but what do you think are some common misconceptions about slavery in Arkansas? Ooh, okay. So one that I really ran into when I was in Northwest Arkansas is the idea that slavery in Arkansas wasn't very important. Like that it, there wasn't that much of it, you know, that it was just like down in the Delta you know, like where you think of cotton, but not, you know, um, everywhere else. And so um, I really try to disabuse people of that. And actually, I shocked some old folks in um, Fayetteville when I lived up there because I did this, um, I don't know, you've probably heard of it. It's like, it's called the Lifelong, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute thing. And mm -hmm. it's like attached to, I mean, I think UA Fort Smith does one, University of Arkansas does one. And I don't know if we do one around here, but you can, you don't have to be a professor or anything, but if you have some kind of expertise, um, maybe it's knitting, maybe it's slavery in Arkansas, right? You can set up a little um, class of a few sessions or just one session, and then you bring whatever your thing is, and then your students, okay, they pay like a subscription really basically to the the uh, OSHA Lifelong Learning folks, and then they get to go to these and they learn, you know, it's a lot of retired cool, people, yeah. right? And so I set this up and then I find out that there are all these retired people in Fayetteville who are from up north and they thought that they were retiring somewhere. They were like, oh, I'm not going to retire in the south. I'm going to go to Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so my class was kind of like, guess what, y'all? <laughs> You're in the south. And so I just was like the bringer of bad news, which I kind of always am. And so I just showed them how like... um. Fayetteville was a slave town, you know what I mean? Like Fayetteville had the largest 
enslaved population um, in proportion to you know the rest of the area than Little Rock did. So I mean, Fayetteville uh, slavery supported that. Um, the sawmill, the um, Van Winkle's mill up there, there were enslaved people creating that lumber that's heading out to places like Fayetteville and Springdale to build Northwest Arkansas in the antebellum period. So it's all over the state. It's every single county and in every part of the state, slaveholders are the ones who have the best land. They're the ones who run the county. They're the ones who run the town. Um, and so it's, um, it's everywhere, you know? So that would be like probably the most common misconception is that it's like me, it's just like a Delta thing or it's, you know, or, or the thing like where people, well, most people didn't own slaves. Most people weren't rich enough, right, to own slaves, like that thing. It's like, well, if you're looking at families, you know, like households. Ooh, you froze up, Dr. Jones. In Arkansas, we're talking 20% people, um, not to mention the ways that mortgaging of enslaved people is um, facilitating business. Uh, in every town, you know, in Arkansas. So it's, it's, it's just um, fundamental to the economy and the society in all parts of the state. Yeah. So, you know, there's some great, um, I, one thing I really enjoyed about that talk you gave uh, at the Old State House Museum is, is what the YouTube channel is on. It's how you were comparing things on um, different sides of, of the river, right? Like, oh, like right. Hey, yeah. these, this county, I mean, I think that's so fascinating. I think that like the regional comparisons that I've seen are fascinating. What about like, I mean, you know, you're talking about how um, South Carolinians may view Arkansans. Like, what do you think are some differences uh, in slavery in Arkansas versus some other states? Maybe not like touching us if that right. or maybe maybe also like i mean i'm fascinated and want to know more about slavery in missouri i would like to have brooks blevins on the podcast oh that would be really great yeah. um you know um diane moody burke moody with two t's burke is b-u-r-k-e she wrote a book called um on slavery's border and it's about the small slave holdings of missouri and it's actually um, and the same series that mine is coming out of oh. um, Georgia's early American places. So, but yeah, Brooks Blevins also like he knows, you know, what's up um, with all this. Yeah, you know, the comparisons are, are are so important because Arkansas. I like to talk about Arkansas as like the newest part of the old South, and so the institutions that people are bringing in the you know 1840s, 1850s, you know, when the migration is you know. Okay, I mean, obviously people are coming earlier than that, but really you're getting this boom, right, in the 1850s for sure. So the institutions are pretty mature from these, you know, this, the generations of chattel slavery that, that have happened and, you know, Virginia, the Carolinas, you know, whatever. So they're bringing these mature institutions in their mind, right, to a very rugged place and so it's interesting to watch them try to recreate, you know, what they're used to um, back. I guess I'm not pointing there. I don't know. I'm pointing like as if I was looking at a map, I guess. And so, um, so that's an interesting part. So like, so for example, um, the patrol system. Arkansas is, I mean, the whole South is rural, okay? But Arkansas is even more rural, even more sparsely populated than the rest, okay, of this, uh, most of it. And so, a patrol system is organized at the um, town level and at the county level. And of course, if it's coming out of the county, then it's coming out of the county seat, which is probably the biggest, most important town, right, in your county. And so in some ways, it's a very sort of urban, you know, kind of um, institution. So when you look at some of the literature, like Sally Haddon's excellent book about slave patrols, She's basing her um, discussions of the patrol system on relatively more urban places in the East, the longest settled parts of the South, right? If you're talking about, you know, colonialist settler, you know, white people, colonialism. And so, you know, how well does that translate, you know, out here? And so what I find is that the patrol system in Arkansas is ad hoc. There is no, you are not gonna find a consistent, like when you see on like movies and TV, like a consistent, these guys are patrolling every night consistently. Uh, and there's like this uh, sort of standardized, you know, thing. The patrol system in Arkansas is ad hoc. It is um, when people think 
you know, that there may be something to be worried about, they'll get more energetic on it. The state law talks about it as a, um, I'm not going to get the exact quote right, but just the, the pretty close wording is like a sleeping power that is um, aroused when it's necessary. And so they've got the framework set up, but there is no such thing as like a constant, you know, every night like patrol system. Now, if you get down to Chico County, you know, here and there, I bet you will find, you know, areas where whites are outnumbered, right, by enslaved yeah. people. Um, it's going to be more energetic. But um, so I guess that's what I'm saying. You could take a book about a topic on the Old South or like connected to slavery. And you do all your research in documents from Virginia and, you know, the Carolinas, you're not going to get the picture of what it's like, you know, in Arkansas. So you got to ask questions about what's different. They would love to have, you know, the kind of um, sort of standardized um, systemic, you know, control that they enjoy in older parts of the slave South, but it's just not going to happen out of the sticks. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, that's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> so you meant, you, you kind of started talking about this at the beginning. Uh, in, in the last question I asked you in this one are like two, the two most, the things I'm too most fascinated by around this topic. Like, what do you think some of the perceptions uh, are that have changed concerning slavery in Arkansas? I mean, obviously you writing a book on it, I bet you've encapsulated several of those perceptions in your, uh, in your book. But what are some perceptions that have changed? You, you mentioned from like 2000 to now, right? Oh, like, right. Okay. So the, the way historians talk about this, you know, well, one thing um, that's caught on lately for sure is um, the emphasis, or I guess I should say the re-emphasis on the capitalism of slavery. And that was something that historians really got into like in the <clears throat> 70s. And there's all these questions about like um, the profitability of slavery and, you know, is it, was chattel slavery in the American South truly a capitalist system if the people who are laboring can't actually sell their labor on the market like stuff like that and you know how profitable was this really is it a social system or is it you know what and so they kind of like they work it out and the easy answer is like yes it's a cap you know it's this very capitalist thing to do um of course it's profitable people don't do things that aren't profitable at some at some level they stop at some point they'll stop doing it um, and so everybody had kind of like put that to bed, but now it's back. And so, and now the way that people talk about it is um, not so much like, is it capitalist or not, but like in what ways did the increasingly harsh commodification of the bodies of black people as chattel contribute to the rise of American capitalism? And so you've got people kind of a little bit like split on that. You know, some are talking about, this is, um, you know, you don't have American capitalism. American capitalism is not American capitalism without slavery and cotton. Um, you've got others who say, well, yeah, okay, it's, it, it would have happened anyway, but it is helped along quite a bit, okay, by the slavery system. Sort of linking the textile industry in the North and certainly in England to, um, you know, the labor system in the South, sort of make, you know, kind of drawing those connections for people. And in some ways, sort of re-emphasizing stuff, you know, ground that had already been kind of, um, you know, pretty well trod. So it's how that stuff shows up in my book is that I try to get people to understand. Uh, I, I work from one historian who's, uh, he has passed since, so we can't ask him about this anymore, but um, he talks about what he calls the second slavery. He's not the only one who uses that term, but Tony yeah. K talks about the second slavery. So there's the older type of slavery. Um, the second slavery around 1820-ish, okay, um, the cotton gin has made its impact uh, as well as Indian removals and cheap land. And so about 1820-ish, okay, all these sort of forces are converging. And so you're getting a new, harsher, more capitalistic system of slavery based on cotton and the expansion of cotton westward, okay? Um, and so that's right when Arkansas hits the ground, you know, as its own territory. And um, when they, um, you know, get their constitution, you know, pushed through without restrictions on slavery, then it swings the doors wide open for the second slavery to come into Arkansas and define it. And so um, that's, that's where I try to show like where some of these larger conversations are touching 
um, the history of Arkansas. Who did you say that historian was, Dr. Jones? His name is Tony K. Anthony K. And it's K A Y E. Okay. And if you email me and remind me, I can send you the article in particular that I'm talking about that he, okay. where he kind of explains like what the second slavery means and like sort of how it changes how we think about things. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I would like to look into that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a couple more questions. Um, and I mean, I've read a little about this and I'm fascinated about it because uh, I've kind of created an assignment and do a little uh, side side bar off of this uh, in my U.S. History One class, but like the whole, which it's called this. I don't think there's much of a. a I mean, I guess it is controversial, it, but the Jeffy uh, Jefferson Hemings controversy, right, is what, oh, right. what it's called, right? So, like, I read a little bit about those types of relationships in well there's a little there's like a couple of sentences about it in the in the in the concise book i, I haven't looked mm. to see if the i've got the the older edition and the new edition hardback as well which i have noticed there's some there's some differences in the text but oh you mean the like the the narrative like history longer one of this yeah 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 yeah, right. yeah the, the narrative yeah. it is a little different from the earlier one and the new one and then mm -hmm. this one is the shorter one yeah see when i went through the course there wasn't that first chapter on um geography and stuff right that's an yeah. improvement yeah oh for sure yeah, that's I, a great I, chapter we went over the six regions but it was like super brief super yeah. brief so um but uh did you i mean can you speak on anything like that in arkansas do you see like i was just so shocked with the jefferson thing about how like hey guess who sally hemming's mom was and what her story was and guess what her mom's story like i was yeah. like it, oh my gosh and how some of the kids passed into white society so yeah. but there were still these lines that kept them I, it just blew my that whole thing the more i learn about it just it blows my mind how complex of a situation it was so complex oh my gosh and you know what that gets to one of the things that i should have mentioned a minute ago and i didn't is that um if you're talking about how the conversations and perceptions about slavery have, has changed among historians the gendered analysis is just has exploded in the last 20 years you know there's so much more emphasis on what it's like um for women as opposed to men in this system, um, you know, revealing what white women are doing, if they're just as, you know, complicit in the system as white men are, which is sort of Captain Obvious, but the literature wasn't showing that. It wasn't emphasizing that, I should say. Um, and so, yeah, the Jefferson, you know, Sally Hemings thing, we do see, and it happened way more than we'll ever know, right, um, in Arkansas. And so the thing I always try to remind my students about is that there really is no such thing as um, consent in these relationships, you know, at the level that we expect in our society, you know, today. And so I always try to kind of like start with that groundwork. So even if you're not talking about a child, which Sally was when that began, uh, if you're, even if you're talking about somebody who's, you know, 20, 25, whatever, um, she is held as chattel by this person. And so it's not a, a um, level playing field. And so there is no, um, it's not a um, healthy like relationship, right? Um, like we expect for people to be able to have um, right now. So I try to like, I don't know, because you know, I've had students call Sally Hemings Jefferson side chick before. And it's like, no. Uh, you know, she's I didn't a, like, uh, did you she's watch like Hamilton? 14 or 15 and it's not even, when it started, she was really yeah. young. But again, even if she was, I, you know, even if she was 45, you know, the, the, the level of consent, it just doesn't exist in that situation, you know? Um, so yeah, it happened in Arkansas and it's not just um, enslavers, okay? Getting with um, violently or otherwise, you know, enslaved women that they hold. It's also, you know, sometimes it's the Irish guy that they hired to, you know, put the brick up around the well house or something, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so they're interacting with other white men. And of course there's little babies um, that will result from that. And so the famous example in Arkansas of a woman leveraging this is Abby Guy. So you may or may not have read about the Abby no, Guy case. Um, so Guy is in G-U-Y. 
this um, was a situation that I argue shows us, there's a little bit about it in my book, and but there's much more written about her than I have. There's some legal, I think his name might be James Scott or something like that in, um, I think it's the UALR Law Journal or something. Some, this, a guy has written about this, um, Abby Guy case. And um, from my point of view, it shows you just how much opportunity relatively there can be for um, these people on the frontier where people are sparsely populated, not everybody knows everybody from back in, you know, Tennessee or whatever. And so this woman comes to Arkansas from Alabama and she's, uh, she was owned by the dad who I think died. And so she passes to the son, but somehow she gets away from him and they're living in South Arkansas and she gets with a white man whose name was, I think, Daniel Guy, or no, I, I can't remember what his name was. Anyway, his last name is Guy, where she gets the name Guy. And so she's living with this man, like as a married couple, and she has babies, and she sends those babies to, because, you know, they don't have a public school system, you know, so you just pay to send your kids to school. So she pays to send her kids to school with white kids, she pays white people to work on her farm. She gets money. She inherits. The guy she was living with um, died. And um, so she's got this acreage and she's just like, you know, living life. And so then all of a sudden this dude's like, she's not a free white woman. She's a slave and I own her and let's do this. And so he sort of like captures her and it goes all the way up to the state Supreme Court. And there's all this fascinating discussion about race and they end up like investigating, like sort of examining like her feet. And I think her kids feet, like just for any indication of like, are you black or are you white? And of course we know that there is no biological category, you know, of black or white. Like we all have genes that we get from our parents and they got them from their parents, you know, and stuff. And that's what gives us our, you know, hair color and skin color and all that kind of stuff. But there is no line, right? Like it's just, it's not a thing. And, um, and of course that's not how they think about race then. And so they're trying to figure out which side of the line, you know, she falls on. Um, and so they finally decide that she's, you know, wide enough that, you know, she's, she can't be held as a slave. And um, I think she successfully sued for um, damages for being wrongfully held in slavery in the time that he like recaptured her or whatever. What, what year was all that? the details, right? So if anybody's listening and like has read this case lately, you know, or um, like I said, the legal historian um, stuff on it, then, you know, I may not have got every part of that detail, right? But the essential truth is there, right? Like the, that the sort of, uh, I don't wanna say chaos, but the sort of fluidity, okay, of the frontier, you know, allows her to live as a white woman for, I mean, it's like 10 years ago. I mean, she's just like living life, you know? Wow. So, yeah. What year? What year was this? Ooh, I'm gonna say mid 1840s, early 1850s. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, wow. it's crazy, huh? Yeah, I will and look. I, I will look into that as well. Um, I think there's an old Arkansas Historical Quarterly article on it too, on Abby V. Guy, uh, Abby Guy V. Daniel or something. I don't remember the name of the case, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a thing uh yeah wow so that's not uh, so much a sally hemings thing though because i'm imagining that her and this dude had you know a adult consensual relationship but as far as fluidity and race and children path and you know all that kind of stuff um she fits the bill mm -hmm. yeah fascinating uh yeah you know that i've seen oh so many different depictions of the um how people interpret that Jefferson Sally mm. Hemings situation. I fall more on the side of the picture that you do. Um, but uh, did you see that musical Hamilton? Yes. I didn't really like how they spun that. Um, I did not either. Okay. I was like, I was saying to my wife, I was like, ah, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this. I do know how I feel about it though. I don't like it. Um, yeah. I, I was like, this isn't good. Uh, and I was trying to explain to her like how I'd arrived at that conclusion. She, she's like, uh, uh, and she's not super familiar with, uh, with the history on it. Uh, but um, yeah, I have, I, I don't know. I had some problems with that. For sure. Yeah. They're just kind of like <laughs> Sally. And it's like a bunch of dudes wrote that. You know what I mean? Like that's a dude, obviously Lin-Manuel Miranda, you know, but she was dressed up like, writers, a, like, like a playboy bunny. Did you catch like, that's, that's the, the vibe I got that she like <sighs> had like a little bunny tail and stuff. on. Oh my gosh. I didn't even notice that. 
that's yeah i mean if my if my memory serves me correctly mm-hmm. i was put out by it anyway yeah that wasn't the best yeah um well okay so last question for you dr jones and we can we can wrap it up um you mentioned this in your talk so i was like i wonder what she's saying because there's a few things that you're like if you guys want to talk after the after the talk all oh, right but I know this has been a long time ago too, but you mentioned like one thing I thought uh, that you're talking about this that was fascinating is you're talking about slaves being in the frontier because they're herding um, livestock or hogs or, or things oh, right. like that, right? Uh, but you mentioned that there were a couple of drownings. Oh, man. Uh, but, uh, with the, uh, them driving and herding livestock on the frontier. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Do you remember what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, so I think the story was probably this. I think his name was Jack. I'm really reaching back here. So I know. I put you on the spot with a bunch of things that, like, and, I, you know. Yeah, and I can't remember if his little anecdote made it into the book or not because sometimes – things got clunky, you know, and for the sake of flow, I had to pull out some of my little anecdotes. I hope he stayed in there. But I, if I remember right, I think his name was Jack. And I always try to, I always try to use the names when I can, because we so rarely have them, you know? And so when we do, I'm like really trying to make sure I I know what they are, but I'm pretty sure his name was Jack. And he's, um, you know, so a lot of times they let the hogs like run loose, right? Because it's just like, they just eat whatever hogs eat, you know, which is like a lot of everything. Um, And then if you need to, you can round them up. And so I think he was out there supposed to maybe either round up hogs or maybe it was cattle because they would let their cattle run loose as well. Um, And so he's out there doing some task, you know, like that. And so he just like never comes back. And um, he also had already lost a leg. And so this one legged Jack is out there like, or an arm, I think it was a leg. I think he only had one leg. Again, I'm really pulling, I'm really reaching from like the the dusty files here. Um, And he is, uh, they found him like out there, like drowned. And he, by the time they found him, I think a couple weeks had passed. Um, And I want to say that this was one of those Mississippi Riverside plantations. It might've been Walworth. I know it wasn't Walgram and it wasn't Lakeport. So it might've been one of Walworth. This guy named Walworth um, had a couple out there. And he actually, he also had at least one across the river too. Um, so yeah, but I've got, um, another, I mean, I don't know. I just, I move, I know I'm, I seem so, um, desensitized and that's just because I'm just like digging into these documents all the time. And sometimes I, um, I may sound a little flippant, you know, but of course it's a horrific story and it must've horrified, you know, the people who know Jack and love Jack. Right. And it just gives you a, um, a little glimpse into how precarious, all of their jobs are because you give the stock driving job to somebody who isn't super physically strong. A lot of times it's a child's job, but you could still, you know, not make it and get hurt. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting small injuries all the time, all different kinds of ways. You know, they're getting their um, arms and legs smashed by, you know, when they're rolling logs and stuff, they're cutting, you know, getting cut at the gym, they're getting caught in the gym, you know, all these different things happen to them. So all of their work is attended to, you know, with some kind of danger. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was one of the extra sort of sad, um, stories, but I've also got another juicy one on the topic of stock raising where there's this guy and they called him old man Humphreys. And I think he was in his seven, like early seventies, late sixties, maybe. And the neighborhood has decided that he's stealing the cows in the neighborhood and, um, that he is employing. Um, an enslaved man to help him do this. And he has others that he holds as well, but this one person in particular is helping him do this. And so the neighbors are like, you know what? He's been doing this for years. He um, runs his stock close to the neighbors because you know, everybody's, everybody's stuff is just running free. And then when he calls them in, he'll just kind of scoop in one of theirs, okay, with his. And then he'll wait till the middle of the night and slaughter it. And so, and this enslaved man helps him do it. It's just like a whole intrigue. Okay. So this old man has been running this racket for several years, according to his neighbors. You know what I mean? Like, who knows? Um, and so they show up and, and then what, it, this was another case that goes all the way to, to the state Supreme court. And I can't remember what the legal issue, you know, why it needed to go, you know, uh, what the sort of, you know, particular appeal was. Um, but in the, in the course of this hall coming out, the neighbors are having to testify well how do you know that he had your cow and it's like well i asked this enslaved man i think his name was peter 
Well, I asked, we asked Peter, you know, about it. And um, they're like, well, did you bribe him? Somebody said that you bribed him. And then this neighbor goes, no, I did not bribe him, but I told him that I would not um, begrudge $20 if I could find out when the cow was in the pen. And $20 at that time was a lot of money. And so it's like, so you did kind of bribe him. And he's like, no, I never did give him $20. I didn't, I didn't give him $20. And so these people find themselves in the middle of these you know, neighbor feuds, you know, and they're playing both sides, right? You help the enslaved, you help the enslaver slaughter the neighbor's cow that you, that the neighbors, you know, that your master, okay, um, stole. And then, but you're also going to rat him out, right? And so, and so they're just like trying to survive, you know what I mean? So it was, yeah. it's pretty wild. Fascinating. Yeah, that's, uh, that was, a, that was just an interesting point that stuck out to me, uh, just with the livestock. Uh, right. It's a huge uh, part of their work. And I probably, I don't know if I do enough. I tried in the last, you know, the most updated version of this manuscript to do justice to that because it's such a ubiquitous part, you know, of agriculture in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully it will be, hopefully it has enough presence that people will get, you know, how just important it was. Yeah. Well, Dr. Jones, I, I appreciate your time today. This has well, been I'm awesome. just like so happy to be invited on your podcast. Hey, I've had a lot of great guests of which you are now one. Uh, and I think about it as like uh, you've now contributed to uh, the database. I definitely right. feel smarter having had this conversation. <laughs> and sometimes I feel smarter. Sometimes I feel dumber. Um, oh, right. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, you did, you did leave me with some good things to um, go and do research on. Uh, this is a, a topic I'm fascinated by already. A lot of times I talk with people about things that, I might not know anything about and I'm learning about for the first time and I say a bunch of stupid stuff. So, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, it's, it's been super informative and um, I really appreciate you taking the time once again. So. Well, thanks so much. So happy to right. do it. All right. Well, Hey, hopefully we'll see you around and um, I'll look forward to uh, seeing uh, the book when it comes out, reading the book. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Stay right. safe out there. All right. We'll see you, Dr. Jones. Have a good day.